tropical storms are known to hit Guam any time of year. The next terrorist attack could happen any time. Mayday, 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 mayday. And so several of us got together and said it's about time we established a center where leaders, military, diplomatic, and others can get together, sit around, chat, yes, argue, and discuss matters of common interests, common concerns, disasters, and come up with solutions. There are two key takeaways from what I've learned so far here from APC says inclusiveness and cooperation. The center uh, brings together people throughout the region, all the countries, and generally a military and a civilian, and puts them in an environment uh, that allows uh, the diversity of the background to come forward and to uh, meld into discussions, fruitful discussions on areas that are of interest to all of us. This is a great opportunity for us to interact and to understand, uh, to get different perspectives on issues from different people, from different backgrounds. Yeah, definitely, I must say, it broadens my perspective when I go back home to, to Gutta. I, I will definitely go back as a person with a broader perspective. So, uh, networking of APCSS. Uh, imagine if uh, I went to the first class in year 2002, and t today it's uh, 2018. I still have many friends from uh, 2002 which I keep on um, chatting uh, via the uh, social network, but they actually help out in my work or even my leisure time also. Uh, we, we, we chat and become friends for life. The courses here are a truly transformational experience. When fellows arrive, we'll maybe get about 100 of them from 45 different countries. They're wondering, what does the U.S. want from them that they've given them this trip to Hawaii? Over the course of four weeks, you see the light turn on. You see them suddenly realize it's not about what the U.S. wants from them, but rather how they can connect with the other people that are in that class. Each class will have over 100 years of experience from different regions where they can share their knowledge and their experiences and their best practices with other people. We have seen some wonderful outcomes as far as new training being developed in country, national security plans being made as a result of their time here. Aloha, and as they say here on the islands, a como mai, which is welcome to the Daniel K. Inouye Speaker Series. I'm Pete Gumatalto, the director of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I am very honored to be your host for our virtual presentation today. This speaker series was created in honor of the late Senator by three organizations, the DKI APCSS, the Daniel K. Inouye Institute, and the Foundation for Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. Senator Inouye, along with other local leaders, had a vision where Hawaii played an important role in promoting a more secure, stable, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. And today, Hawaii does play an important role in the security of the region. It is a security focal point with key headquarters, units from all the services, guards and reserves, and a community that supports national security in many ways. In today's complex environment, there is a critical need to come together, not with the military alone, but with the whole of society, to listen, to share, and to come away with a better understanding of mutual solutions. The speaker series is our way of being inclusive and inviting you all into conversations about security. 
Tonight, we are very honored and proud to have my boss, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Dr. Mark Esper, as our speaker. He is here in Hawaii to help celebrate the 75th anniversary of the ending of World War II. And he also graciously agreed to join us at the center to help celebrate our 25th anniversary. Secretary Esper, we're so pleased that you'd be with us tonight to share your perspectives on our complex security environment and the value of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Before we proceed with the rest of this program, I would like to say a few words about our 25th anniversary. Our center was formally established on September 4th, 1995, which also happened to be just a few days before Senator Inouye's 71st birthday. He and several other key leaders at the time, including Defense Secretary William J. Perry and the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Command, Admiral Richard Mackey, wanted to create a haven for understanding and collaboration. At the time, there was no place for leaders in the region to come together here in Hawaii. But today, DKI APCSS creates that place. Here, a diverse group of security practitioners can focus on broad, multilateral approaches to addressing regional security issues and opportunities. DKI APCSS educates, connects, and empowers through our courses, workshops, visitors programs, ongoing publications, and now, more than ever, virtual engagements. After 25 years, more than 14,000 alumni form the backbone of network relationships built on transparency, mutual respect, and inclusion. Their shared understanding leads to mutual cooperation and common solutions for security throughout the region. Our alumni leave here inspired and ready to take the next step up to the next level. In the last 25 years, our alumni have produced incredible outcomes. For example, and just to name a few, they have written national security plans and policies, developed national programs to improve resiliency before, during, and after a disaster, built capacity and improved program processes in their various ministries, developed training for security practitioners in their own country and build trusted relationship that open the lines of communications for better sharing of information and best practices. Looking to the future, DKI APCSS remains committed to being trusted by our stakeholders and partners in the region agile enough to respond to major changes in the world as we know it, and continues to be a haven for understanding and cooperation. The bottom line is that our center will continue to serve as a bridge between the United States and its allies and partners to build a secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. If you had joined us a few minutes before the start of the program, you might have seen our slideshow created with photos and greetings by alumni from 53 countries from the Indo-Pacific and beyond. We have a few more videos to share with you tonight. Dr. Cyro Kusi is a distinguished alumni from the Philippines. He is currently with the Philippine National Security Council Secretariat. He represents a very proactive and engaged alumni community, many in senior level positions, who are making a positive difference 
in the world today. Following Mr. Kusi will be the commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Philip Davidson. DKI APCSS enjoys a very strong and active mission partner relationship with Indo-PACOM. Admiral Davison is a great advocate of the center and he has also benefited by being able to access our alumni community of security practitioners for discussions on the value of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Aloha everyone and mabuhay from the Philippines. My name is Sayri Kusi, currently the Director for Policy and Strategic Studies Office of the National Security Council Secretariat. On behalf of the National Security Council and our National Security Advisor, Hermo Hennessy Esperon Jr., I would like to express our sincere appreciation to the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, headed by Director Pete Gumatautau, for the continuing support to our organization. The DKI APCSS has been a valuable partner of the NSC over the years in the promotion of peace, prosperity, and stability, not only in the Philippines, but also in the Asia-Pacific region. More, sp more specifically, we are very grateful for the Center's tremendous support in the crafting of our National Security Policy 2011-2016 and National Security Policy 2017-2018 and our first ever National Security Strategy 2018. Through the alumni network, I'm also able to assist other fellows, especially from the Marshall Island, in crafting their own national security policy. Once again, thank you for this opportunity and for your support. I hope that the center also continuously help the Philippines in advancing security sector governance in the future. Mabuhay and mahalu. To all the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies teammates and alumni around the world, congratulations to the staff, both past and present, as well as the esteemed alumni on this 25th anniversary of the establishment of APCSS. The center's legacy in educating, connecting, and empowering security practitioners throughout the Indo-Pacific and the world is widely renowned and serves as a testament to the value of the center to the security, stability, and prosperity of our region. Since 1995, APCSS has been critical to Indo-Pacific Command's mission and has created a lasting legacy of transparency, mutual respect, and inclusion. So thank you for your honorable service and your impressive accomplishments in advancing our vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two co-hosts for this event, the Daniel K. Inouye Institute, which promotes the late Senator's legacy with today's and future generations and the Foundation for the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, which was created to assist the center in its mission. Mr. Jerry Sumida, president of the Foundation for the Asia Pacific Center, is an active member in a number of local and international organizations with a focus on education and understanding. Daniel K. Inouye Institute Director, Ms. Jennifer Sabas, is a former Chief of Staff to Senator Inouye and is currently a member of the Military Affairs Council here in Honolulu. Both institutions work side by side with the Center to promote mutual understanding, cooperation, and collaboration. Aloha and welcome to this special presentation in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. My name is Jerry Sumida, 
and I'm the president of the foundation for the Daniel K. Inouye APCSS. I am especially pleased and honored to welcome you to this presentation by Secretary of Defense Mark T. Esper on the occasion of this 25th anniversary. Our foundation provides financial support to selected programs of the center, as well as broader recognition within Hawaii's communities. Our members include business, professional, and community leaders within Hawaii and elsewhere who recognize the unique role that the center plays both in this region as well as in Hawaii. We are pleased to join the center and the Daniel K. Inouye Institute in sponsoring this particular special program. Let me now turn to Jennifer Sabas of the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. Thank you again for your participation in this memorable event. Aloha. The Daniel K. Inouye Institute is a proud sponsor of this speaker series, and this one in particular, as we celebrate the center's 25th anniversary. Senator Inouye and Senator Ted Stevens visited the Marshall Center in Europe in the early 1990s and decided we needed a similar center in the Asia Pacific. And the rest is history. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your presence in Hawaii to commemorate the end of World War II and to honor the sacrifice of many. Hawaii continues to play a critical strategic role in our nation's defense posture in the Asia Pacific region. An important asset in this regard is a homeland defense radar for Hawaii. Our leaders have come together to support its location at the Pacific Missile Range Facility on Kauai. Mr. Secretary, we look forward to your remarks. Aloha. Thank you, Jerry and Jen, for your kind remarks and also for your support. And now it gives me great honor to introduce our speaker this evening, the United States Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Dr. Mark Esper. Dr. Esper was sworn in as the 27th Secretary of Defense just over a year ago. Prior to that, he served as the Secretary of the Army. He brings with him a very unique background that encompasses academics, business, think tanks, and the military and civilian government sectors. Dr. Esper started his military career after graduating from the U.S. Military Academy. During his time on active duty, he served in the 101st Airborne Division with the Screaming Eagles. In 2007, he retired from the military with 10 years of active duty with the U.S. Army and 11 years in the National Guard and the U.S. Army Reserves. Among his many military awards and decorations are the Legion of Merit, Bronze Star Medal, the highly coveted Ranger Tab, and the Combat Infantryman Badge. After retiring, he worked for the think tank before heading to Capitol Hill to work with Senator Hagel. And as a professional staff member on a number of committees, including the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. We at DKI APCSS first had the opportunity to know him when he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Negotiations Policy. Dr. Esper holds a Master of Public Administration degree from Harvard's University John F. Kennedy School of Government and a doctorate in public policy from George Washington University. Public administration and public policy both are about setting the environment for doing the right thing, or ike pono, as we say in Hawaii. Being able to see the needs of our military, our government, and the region, and then supporting policies to help build a secure, stable, and prosperous Indo-Pacific is vital. One of those essential policies is the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Mark Esper.
Well, aloha and good afternoon and thank you, Admiral Gumatata, for that kind introduction. It is really great to be here with you today in honor of the 25th anniversary of your ongoing efforts to educate, connect with, and empower our partners throughout the Indo-Pacific. And I must say, it's a little personal for me as well as I walked in here today. I had the fortunate opportunity to work with Senator Inouye during my time in the Senate, to get to know him, to travel with him, uh, both in DC and here, and to get to know his staff. And uh, while I had great regard for him as a lawmaker, as somebody who could always reach across the aisle and do what's right for our nation's defense, uh, I was even more impressed by the fact that he was that he had earned the Medal of Honor in World War II for his courage under fire. And he and I had the chance to have a couple conversations about that during his time. So thank you for that opportunity to come here and to celebrate his legacy here at your 25th anniversary. For decades, APCSS has leveraged its unique position in the region as part of the Department of Defense to enhance our mission of forging lasting security partnerships across the Indo-Pacific and advancing the security interests of the United States and our allies. This week, I'm traveling throughout the region to highlight our successes when it comes to that mission and to put it into contrast as we commemorate the end of World War II 75 years ago. When we reflect on the tremendous sacrifices of the greatest generation, we are reminded that together, America and its allies delivered victory for freedom and built an international order that has brought prosperity and security to the globe for more than seven decades. Today, regrettably, that free and open system is under duress. In fact, the vision that the late Senator Inouye had for this institution upon its founding is more relevant than ever in this era of great power competition. The importance he placed on strengthening partnerships and cultivating new relationships has never been more pronounced. Indeed, our robust network of allies and partners remains the enduring asymmetric advantage we have over near peer rivals, namely China, that attempt to undermine and subvert the rules-based order to advance their own interests, often at the expense of others. In light of this challenge, the national defense strategy guides us as we enhance our lethality, strengthen those alliances and build partnerships, and reform the department to align our resources with our highest priorities. One of the goals that drives our implementation of the NDS is to focus the department on China. To do this, we have stood up a new defense policy office on China and established a China strategy management group to integrate our efforts. I also directed our National Defense University to refocus its curriculum by dedicating 50% of its coursework to China. And I tasked the military services to make the PRC the pacing threat in all of our schools, our programs, and our training. These efforts are critical to preparing our military's future leaders for tomorrow's challenges, one of which I'd like to talk about more today. Under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, Beijing has repeatedly fallen short of its promises to do the following, abide by international laws, rules, or norms, despite continuing to reap the benefits of the international system and free markets. And second, to honor the commitments it made to the international community, including promises to safeguard the autonomy of Hong Kong and not to militarize features in the South China Sea. Beijing's self-serving behavior, however, is not isolated to just the Indo-Pacific region. Increasingly, our like-minded partners around the world are experiencing the CCP's systematic rule-breaking behavior, debt-backed economic coercion, and other malign activities meant to undermine the free and open order that has benefited nations of all sizes, China included. For example, China's illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing has wrought economic and ecolog ecological damage in, in the Caribbean and Latin America, in Africa, in the Pacific Islands, and beyond. Further, Beijing has failed to uphold its obligations on the World Trade Organization and hampered global efforts to control the coronavirus pandemic due to its lack of transparency with the World Health Organization. Moreover, the PRC's destabilizing actions go beyond its subversive political and economic activity. To advance the CCP's agenda, the People's Liberation Army continues to pursue an aggressive modernization plan to achieve a world-class military by the middle of the century. This will undoubtedly embolden the PLA's provocative behavior in the South and East China Seas 
and anywhere else the Chinese government has deemed critical to its interests. Unlike America's armed forces, the PLA is not a military that serves its nation or a constitution. Rather, it serves a political entity, the Chinese Communist Party, in its attempts to undermine rules and norms across the globe. In fact, China's global ambitions include establishing a security presence at strategic access points, such as its base in Africa, to enhance its abil ability to project power globally and across all domains. Clearly, China seeks to undermine the free and open order itself, which impacts every nation supporting and benefiting from this system. That is why this institution's forward location and unique role on the front lines of our long-term competition here in the Indo-Pacific is so very important. Over the past 25 years, APCSS has served as the regional touchpoint for nearly 14,000 pr practitioners from over 100 countries, playing an important role in the department's ongoing efforts to implement the national defense strategy and our Indo-Pacific strategy in particular. The NDS identifies the Indo-Pacific as the department's priority theater, given its economic and strategic significance. More than half of all global maritime trade transits through Asia, and the region alone accounts for 60% of the world's gross domestic product. Moreover, the Indo-Pacific is home to six nuclear nations and seven of the world's 10 largest standing armies. Further, the Indo-Pacific faces some of the world's most dynamic security challenges, to include a defiant North Korea, a violent extremism, and a host of transnational threats, such as piracy, human and arms trafficking, natural disasters, and now a global pandemic. But most importantly, the Indo-Pacific is the epicenter of a great power competition with China. In light of this reality, the department is committed to implementing a comprehensive strategy for the region that is based on one, preparedness, two, strengthening our alliances and partnerships, and three, promoting and expanding a network of like-minded partners. First, under preparedness, we are divesting from legacy systems and focusing on modernizing our forces so we can deter, compete, and if necessary, fight and win across all domains, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. Thanks to our largest research and development budget in the department's history, we are prioritizing the development and deployment of game-changing technologies, such as hypersonic weapons, 5G, and artificial intelligence. We are also investing in platforms critical to the future of a free and open Indo-Pacific, such as submarines, B-21 stealth bombers, P-8 mar maritime patrol aircraft, unmanned underwater and surface vehicles, long-range precision munitions, integrated air and missile defenses, and a new class of frigates. In the coming days, I look forward to visiting Guam to see firsthand some of the investments we have made to develop the island as a strategic hub for our presence in the region. This includes the addition of air and missile defense capabilities, advanced intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems, and our ongoing bomber task force missions that prepare us to defend the Indo-Pacific at a moment's notice. Moreover, we are transforming the way we fight by developing a new joint warfighting concept for the 21st century and implementing other initiatives that make us more strategically predictable to our partners and operationally unpredictable to our competitors. These efforts prepare our military for future conflicts that we, we hope we won't need to fight, but must and will be prepared to win. We recognize that many of these concepts rely on close coordination and collaboration with our partners and allies. This is why assisting countries across the region to develop their national security policies, strategies, plans, and laws is so very critical. This type of work with nations such as Bangladesh, Mongolia, the Philippines, and several Pacific Island nations has helped put like-minded partners on a path toward greater pr preparedness, enabling them to become more, con uh, more confident in their sovereignty. That brings me to the second pillar, strengthening our alliances and partnerships, a bedrock of our strategy. U.S. engagement in the Indo-Pacific region is rooted in our long-standing security alliances, which provide an asymmetric advantage that our adversaries simply do not have. Our shared security concerns and desire to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific have yielded countless bilateral and multilateral initiatives throughout the region aimed at strengthening and expanding defense cooperation and alignment. Notably, one of the major ways that we are enhancing the interoperability and bolstering our partners' capabilities 
is through an improved and expanded foreign military sales program. By streamlining, streamlining the FMS process, we have lowered costs and accelerated our response time to partner nation requests, allowing us to deliver critical capabilities more quickly and more effectively. Today, there are more than $160 billion worth of FMS, FMS projects underway across the Indo-Pacific, including 22 billion in newly initiated projects in this fiscal year alone, which is almost half of all foreign military sales globally. We are providing F-35 aircraft to Japan, Seahawk and Apache helicopters to India, and F-16 fighter jets and M1 Abrams tanks to Taiwan, just to name a few examples. In addition, the United States has provided nearly $400 million of assistance to bolster the maritime security and domain awareness capabilities of partners such as the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Further, we continue to make progress in deepening our defense relationships across the region. With Thailand, for example, we are co-procuring striker armored vehicles. And with Japan, we are moving into the production phase of a co-developed ground-based interceptor missile, the SM-3 Block 2A. Last month, during consultations with my Australian counterpart, we signed a statement of principles that will enhance our defense relationship and posture in the region for the next decade and beyond. Similarly, last fall, we renewed a key agreement with Singapore, extending U.S. forward presence and cooperation in the region for another 15 years. We are also looking to expand our engagement with new and emerging partners throughout South and Southeast Asia. For instance, we have upgraded our defense relationship with India to a major defense partnership, and we held our first ever joint military exercise with them last year, along with combined naval exercises earlier this summer. Additionally, this past spring, we conducted the second ever U.S. carrier visit to Vietnam in over four decades, a sign of our deepening relationship. We also continue to seek opportunities to build our relationships with Timor-Leste and Mongolia, as well as the Pacific Islands, militaries in Papua New Guinea, Fiji, and Tonga. Looking to the future, we continue to enhance our cooperation alongside our allies to maintain our technological advantage in the newest warfighting domains, cyberspace and space. One significant milestone was our expansion of Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty to include cyber attacks as one of the dangers that under certain circumstances, could warrant an alliance response. Likewise, the United States and our allies have taken decisive action to counter China's attempts to manipulate, disrupt, and undermine our technological edge, namely by denying access to high-risk 5G vendors, something Japan, Australia, and New Zealand did early on. I continue to encourage all like-minded partners to carefully consider the choices, their choices regarding telecommunications infrastructure and assess the long-term collective risks of using Chinese state-backed vendors. Our third and final goal in promoting a more network region is to encourage the growth of interconnected security partnerships that serve as a force multiplier to advance our shared interests. A prime example is our ongoing multinational effort to enforce United Nations Security Council resolutions and sanctions on North Korea. The combined capabilities of the United States, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, France, Canada, and the United Kingdom are a powerful show of support, reinforcing the will of the international community. Other examples include Japan's provision of maritime vessels for regional capacity building, the logistical support agreement being finalized between Australia and India, South Korea's pledge to more than double its development assistance to ASEAN nations by 2020, and maritime and air patrols coordinated by Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines to combat illicit transborder activities in the Sulu and Celebes seas. These efforts extend to training and exercises as well. This year, the United States and the Royal Thai Armed Forces co-hosted the 39th Cobra Gold exercise in Thailand for over 9,000 personnel from 29 countries. Meanwhile, Canada and Japan have conducted bilateral military exercises in the Indo-Pacific since 2016. And for the past five years, Australia, Japan, and the United States have partnered with Timor-Leste for an annual engineering exercise to support capacity building. Finally, in recent years, we've expanded the RIMPAC exercise to include our Western Hemisphere partners, such as Colombia and Peru. 
All participating nations play a vital role in ensuring interoperability across the Pacific, and I was pleased to witness this cooperation firsthand earlier today. Together, we will continue to find new ways to enhance preparedness, strengthen partnerships, and promote a more networked region, which allow us to protect a free and open Indo-Pacific for all. APCSS will remain an important part of that effort by encouraging candid and open exchanges on regional security issues and strengthening the intellectual interoperability we need to be successful. As we continue to implement our Indo-Pacific strategy, the United States needs our allies and partners to contribute in ways that are fair and equitable. We need them to pursue close alignment and policies that uphold a free and open order and reject decisions that would benefit malign actors to our collective detriment. And we need them to make the necessary investments to improve their capabilities so that together we can safeguard our interests, strengthen our readiness and defend our sovereignty and our values. In doing so, we will secure freedom and prosperity for future generations, much like we did 75 years ago when allied forces fought shoulder to shoulder against tyranny. Together, we prevailed in a conflict unlike anything the world had ever experienced. And today, I'm confident that we, much like our predecessors, can muster the same strength, resolve, and commitment to deter the threats of today and overcome the challenges of tomorrow. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Secretary Esper, for sharing your insights and, and the very informative and detailed information regarding some of the views we have in the region and the importance of the region. For our virtual audience, I ask for your indulgence for a moment while we pause just now as we prepare and reset for our question and answer session. Thank you. As our audience registered for this event, we gave them an opportunity to submit a question for the secretary. For those that did take the time to submit a question, thank you. These questions give us the opportunity to hear the secretary's perspectives on the challenges and opportunities in the Indo-Pacific region. Due to time constraints, we won't be able to get to all of the submitted questions so we have selected those that reflect the most common concerns of the region, as well as specific concerns from the sub-regions. Mr. Secretary, frankly, sir, as I listened closely to your remark, remarks, mm -hmm. you addressed and touched on all these questions I, I, we have assembled to ask from you from the audience. So, it's, uh, so if you're ready, sir, I would like to tee up the first sure. question. Mr. Secretary, the United States has made clear that it supports a free and open Indo-Pacific. What are some of the core ways the department's strategy helps to make this a reality? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I addressed some of that in my remarks, but let me emphasize and provide some color. You know, first, first and foremost, we have the National Defense Strategy that says we're going to pursue three lines of effort. One is uh, building our, improving our lethality and our readiness. Two, strengthening our alliances and partnerships. And three, reforming. And so, uh, as, as you may know, over the past year, we've undergone a significant reform effort to free up time, money, and manpower to put back into number one and number two. And that has yielded nearly $6 billion in our first uh, go around. And we're putting those monies back into the technologies I mentioned, hypersonics, AI, 5G, robotics, um, uh, advanced air and missile defense capabilities, many things that are critically important uh, in in all regions of the world, but in some cases, particularly this part of the world, when you think about long range precision fires, or you think about uh, how we can use air missile defenses uh, in, in, in this part of the world. So that's the first means by which we do it. And then through the foreign military sales process, we can extend those capabilities to our allies and partners. 
which has the benefit of not just improving their, their capability and capacity, but it really improves upon the relationship and builds interoperability because now we know we can talk to each other. We can, if you could talk to one another and exchange data, then you can fight alongside one another and you could uh, use the same tactics and techniques and procedures. So all that is a very important and things that we want to continue. I'd also add uh, uh, that we are trying to enhance our relationships in other ways. How do we expand, for example, the IMET program, which you may be familiar with, the, uh, the military education and training program, something I experienced during my time in the service as well. Very important to building those long-term relationships that will endure uh, uh, through, through time and through the ages. So building that is very important as well. Uh, with regard to allies and partners, uh, again, it's important to strengthen our longstanding alliances, but the importance of reaching out to new partners. So my first, uh, during my first month on the job, the first trip I made was to the Indo-Pacific region. And I visited not just with our Australian allies and, and Japanese, but I went and visited countries like Mongolia uh, eventually and other places uh, where we could build a, a broader network, uh, which gets to that third pillar of our Indo-Pacific strategy. So when you look at all these functions, what we're trying to do is get out, build a network and, 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 and aspire to allies and partners in a way that we are, that to let them know that we are committed to that free and open Indo-Pacific, that we want to help each country build its own capabilities, that we want to help them secure their own sovereignty, that we want to help maintain those, those norms and expectations that, that have served us all now for well over seven decades. And that's what we're committed to. And those are just some examples by which we're doing it. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. And what struck me on that remark is the network of relationships of like-minded nations. And that's why it's a collective effort. Thank you, sir. In keeping with the same theme, Mr. Secretary, it's been two years since the National Defense Strategy identified this long-term strategic competition with China. And I know you mentioned this uh, in your remarks, and, and it's one of the department's most pressing priorities that you've alluded to. What adjustments has the department made in that time to address this growing threat? Well, you know, again, I mentioned some of those in my remarks. We've established a new office on China with a deputy assistant secretary. I have the China uh, Strategy Management Group that coordinates all of our efforts. We're updating all of our plans. Uh, one of the things I'll spend time out here uh, this week with Indo-PACOM, uh, Admiral Davidson, to do is to, to talk through our plans, but, and also to talk through how he sees the region in the future and how do we make, need to make adjustments with regard to the disposition of forces, uh, those types of things. Uh, I have directed a, a change in coursework for our senior service colleges and have identified China as the pacing threat for our military. So there are a number of things like that that we're pursuing across the board. And by the way, it's while, while Indo-PACOM is the epic uh, epicenter, if you will, of this great power competition, we, we actually know it's a global competition. China and Russia are in all parts of the globe and we need to be able to deal with them, whether it's in the CENTCOM AOR or the Arctic, uh, Indo-PACOM or Europe. And so uh, what it is, is appealing to those like-minded nations to make sure we're doing everything we can to address that. And again, uh, with regard to our own capabilities, we continue to make these big investments on the next generation of technologies that we think will be critical to making sure we can maintain that deterrent capability uh, for years to come. That begins with our strategic nuclear triad, which we are modernizing all three legs of, but also gets into our naval forces, marine forces, army, air force, all four of them are developing a different doctrine, uh, new techniques and tactics, uh, new ways of war fighting. I spent time out today on the USS Essex mm -hmm. to see what they're doing and to watch two live missile shots. So it's a very exciting time for each of our services as we look ahead and think about how we can continue to maintain uh, peace and stability and security in the Indo-Pacific region and deter China and hopefully uh, uh, continue to work with uh, the, the People's Republic to get them back on a trajectory that is more in line with the international rules-based order that we expect of all countries. Yes, sir. What strikes me about those remarks is the adaptability mm -hmm. that the department has done to adjust to a very complex security environment. Thank you. So the next two questions, if you don't mind, I'm going to combine because it, it talks about allies and partners. And I know throughout your whole remarks, you emphasize the importance and it's one of our priorities, strengthening allies and partners. So I want to ask three, two questions on that. First, what role do you see for the United States allies and partners in supporting U.S. efforts on great power competition? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And second is, what are some of the steps the department is taking 
to build the capabilities of its allies and partners in the region. Sure, I mean, those are both very critical. As I've said many times, whether it's in Europe, uh, the Middle East, or here in particular, uh, our allies and partners are an asymmetric advantage, advantage that neither China nor Russia uh, uh, can imitate, uh, nowhere near. And why is that? Because I think most countries understand that, that what the United States stands for is democratic values, human rights, the free and open Indo-Pacific, um, uh, respecting uh, all nations and, uh, and their sovereignty. And so when we speak to this, that's, those are the values that we speak to. I think those are the values that the United States has represented since its founding and certainly has pushed hard in the seven decades since the end of World War II, which will commemorate uh, in the coming days here. So uh, that is the pill we make to our allies and partners. As I go around the region and speak to them, I hear it over and over and over again. And look, in many cases, um, some countries are capable of speaking publicly about the concerns they have about China, but many aren't. You know, the, um, the hand of Beijing is heavier on a country the smaller one is. And particularly for some of the smaller countries, they feel that coercion. They see the bullying that is happening out there. And, um, and, and they recognize the important role that the United States plays in this emerging, evolving great power competition. And they wanna be part of a team, uh, the, the, the team that we're trying to build that will continue to espouse those important values uh, that we have out there and have for many times. And look, uh, that's building capability, which is a second part of your question, is one of the things we do through foreign military cells, mm -hmm. you know, interoperability and training, which we're doing this week in RIMPAC, mm -hmm. you know, Cobra Gold, I mentioned with Thailand, 39 years uh, we've been doing that. And there's other exercises in the region we've been doing for decades. So they see that too. And then they see the work of this center and what you're doing. Just another example of how we're trying to bring countries together how we're trying to build that broader network and how we're building it around values, uh, core sets of common interests, things that pull us together, things that draw and bind freedom loving people all around the world. That's what we appeal to. Thank you, sir. And, and I have to admit in our travels around the region and our discussions, the values and, and, and the principles of the free and open Indo-Pacific, it resonates so well. As, as you know, Prime Minister Abe had mentioned that yeah years ago and and that is something that people turn around and say hey we have different views different priorities however comma those principles and standards of sovereignty individual liberty open right. commerce were all all very like a glue mm -hmm. for discussion and cooperation sir so we have a number of questions here if if, if i may that ask about the uh, applications of priorities and roles by sub region so those earlier questions are big picture. And so uh, we've asked and looked at many questions. And so we tried to put it into uh, uh, inputs from different subregions. The first one comes from Southeast Asia. What specific role do you see from the ASEAN nations in preserving a free and open Indo-Pacific and anything specific in regards to the role in the South China Sea? And look, I think ASEAN is critical. I had the chance last fall to attend the ASEAN Defense Ministers Conference where we discussed many of these same ideas and I had uh, the opportunity to conduct a number of bilaterals. Look, I think uh, our ASEAN partners recognize that the United States believes in governance and transparency, accountabil accountability, and ASEAN centrality as, uh, as very important as well. And uh, we are committed to advancing that. And, and I, I noted before about our longstanding partnerships and presence. We've been a partner with ASEAN for over four decades, 40 plus years uh, we've been there with ASEAN. And, and um, uh, I look forward to continue to building our relationship with ASEAN and those countries both, uh, not only just multilaterally, but bilaterally as well. And uh, I've had the chance to visit Vietnam, for example, and meet with them. I've had the chance to visit Thailand and meet with the Thais. And in each of these countries and many of these ASEAN partners, I've either visited them or had a chance to speak to them on the phone uh, talk to my counterparts, and the same themes keep coming up over and over and over again. So again, ASEAN is critically important. Uh, Southeast Asia is uh, an important part of the world. We see Southeast Asia, particularly in the South China Sea area, is where China seems to be flexing its muscles the most and uh, conducting some of its worst behavior. Uh, I've spoken before about the sinking of a Vietnamese fishing vessel, um, the coercion we've seen around denying countries uh, their ability to extract minerals or um, uh, petroleum, for example, from their uh, economic zones. Uh, we see the intrusion of Chinese fishing 
uh, vessels in territorial waters. So all these things are, are, seem to be concentrated in the South China Sea. And that's where uh, ASEAN will, will play an important role as well as, uh, as, as we look ahead. So thank you, sir. And it should not be lost to our virtual audience that in our national security strategy, it not only talks about the importance of allies and partners, but also the criticality of working closely with regional institutions like ASEAN. Absolutely. So I'm gonna to shift to Oceana. And we do have several questions, so if, if you indulge me, sir. Uh, how important is it to the department that it strengthens its relationship with Pacific Island nations? And what are we doing to build these partnerships? And then the last is, what is being done to counter the growing Chinese influence in that region? Look, the Pacific Island countries are very important, very critical uh, to the region and to our strategy as well. And uh, we have great respect for them and their sovereignty. And I think we need to spend more time and attention and investment on uh, these important countries. So this week alone, I will be visiting uh, 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 Palau in the coming days. I look forward to spending a whole day there at Palau and talking to them about their defense needs and, and exchanging views on any number of issues to include you know, Chinese, uh, Ch the Chinese presence in the region. I just got off the phone uh, not long ago with the Defense Minister for Papua New Guinea, mm. and we discussed a number of issues, areas where the United States and uh, PNG are cooperating, uh, where we think there's a lot of opportunities. And I've had similar conversations with countries, you know, all throughout the region. So a very important part of the world. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the vastness of, uh, of the Pacific and the important strategic importance of Pacific Island countries, many cost, cro uh, cut across sea lines of communication, mm -hmm. Uh, critical to uh, navigation and any number of issues and all important peoples with different cultures and backgrounds and histories, many of which are intertwined with the United States and in different roles. So it's something that uh, we in the Department of Defense and certainly our, our partners in the Department of State will continue to pay more attention to and conduct more outreach with. Yes, sir. And, and, in, and that third question on the growing influence of China and what we are doing to counter that influence in the region, sir? Yeah, look, I, I said earlier that, um, you, you know, the smaller the country, the, the heavier the hand of Beijing. And you see this all the time, whether it's debt diplomacy, uh, whether it's some type of economic coercion, whether they're trying to buy their way into a port or, uh, you know, trying to uh, hold out that carrot of economic assistance. But they always come with strings and catches and everything else. And We've seen that, I think, most vividly here in the past several months with coronavirus. Um, here's a country where, from which the coronavirus uh, uh, COVID-19 emerged. Uh, they were very opaque, uh, unwilling to share what they knew, and we saw this pandemic spread globally. And, uh, and, and then they tried to capitalize it on it later by uh, trying to promote how uh, their view that maybe the Chinese system is better than everybody else's to, to pretend, prevent the pandemic. Look, it, what we expect is uh, what we expect of everybody, uh, and that is uh, those norms and, and rules of behavior, and that is uh, sharing and being transparent and being accountable and not trying to take advantage of others uh, uh, when countries are down. You know, we, uh, we're trying, we, the United States, have uh, put forward millions of dollars to many of our partners to help them through this COVID-19 crisis, um, and other countries have reciprocated. Um, that hasn't been the case with China per se. And so rather than this being a period for one country, China, China trying to take advantage of the situation, trying to capitalize on others' uh, misfortune, uh, they should act like most countries, and that is try and help one another and try and help us through these tough times. And we will get there, uh, but we will get there together. So it's important that we do that. And again, it's important that we be attentive to the needs of Pacific Island countries, countries of all sizes, shapes, situations, um, uh, as, as we work our way through the coronavirus pandemic, um, uh, the, the economic crisis that has resulted from that, and, uh, and, and until we get our stuff back up on our feet, and then continue to build forward, again, this great international order and system that has served us so very well for decades, and preserving that. Yes, sir, thank you. And I, I think your remark about uh, uh, listen to their needs, I think will resonate so well back mm -hmm. in Oceana, and I do know uh, with the DOD working closely with the Pacific Islands Forum, Australia, New Zealand, and other like-minded countries that want to go in there and collaborate and collectively come and, and bring together capacities and capabilities. It's not just one country 
that would solve it. It's listening to what they need, working together. And I think uh, that's, we've seen that very actively here, particularly when the time I've been here. So thank you, sir. No, I completely agree. I've spoken to you know, my counterparts from many of those countries you mentioned, Australia, uh, Japan, et cetera. They do a lot of good work in the region and uh, have a lot of good outreach and connectivity that, uh, that uh, we aspire to mimic in many ways. And uh, they provide all of us a lot of good insights, a lot of good sharing going around. And you know, I, I should mention, since I, I was just talking about coronavirus, you know, you, you want to try and look for the, the silver lining of every cloud. And I will tell you, a silver lining that has come out of the pandemic is as we've been prevented from traveling as much as we all would like. But I have found that uh, the United States and many of its closest partners have turned to uh, uh, you know, video teleconferences like yes. this. Yes, sir. And we've actually found more opportunities to meet and talk rather than just relying on you know, long plane flights and annual conferences. So in some ways it's brought us together. Many of us, a few of us have kind of made a commitment to do it uh, more frequently, uh, those types of conferences, so that we can continue to share information and look for ways to again, build upon that third pillar of our Indo-Pacific strategy, and that is building this network of nations out there. Uh, and I think that will, the more we can do that, the more we will be better served in the long run. Thank you, sir. So let me shift to the South Asia. Mm -hmm. How are you implementing the major defense partnership with India? Why is this important? What is the impact of tensions between China and India over the line of actual control? Sure. Well, look, I think India will be one of the most uh, consequential relationships for the United States uh, in, the, in the 21st century. Um, you know, as I think about this, I recall that um, I've had several tours in the Department of Defense when I was a Deputy Assistant Secretary in 02, 03. Those were the early years of us trying to build this relationship. And when I came back in 2017, I was just really astounded by how far this relationship has matured. Mm -hmm. and, and I will tell you, in the past year as Secretary of Defense, I've had a chance to host my counterpart here in the United States. I had a two plus two with, with the Secretary of State and his counterpart. I've spoken on the phone many times uh, with the Minister of Defense from India, and most recently over these uh, uh, tensions with China, which is another example uh, by which China would try to take advantage of, a, of the coronavirus and what was happening globally to capitalize on, uh, on what was happening uh, along the line of actual control. And so here's another example of Chinese bad behavior uh, that wasn't necessary. Now that said, it's good to see that both sides are talking about de-escalating. We encourage that. But in the meantime, we are gonna continue to build that relationship with India. I spoke about our first combined exercises last year. In the past month, this summer, we had uh, the USS Nimitz cruising in the Indian Ocean with the Indian Navy, yes, sir. which was important. We continue a lot of good uh, information sharing between our countries. Arms sales are important. Again, not just because you're, you're selling arms, but the, the, with the United States, arms sales come with a relationship, a long-term long relationship. So all those things are good and moving in the right direction. And I think it's very, very important for the, the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy to continue to build along because we have so many shared values. Uh, there's such a great relationship between our peoples um, great accomplishments by Indian Americans uh, in all 50 states. So I'm, I'm really hopeful for the future. And it's a relationship I want to continue to build. I'll be traveling there in the next few months as well for, for another ministerial. And I just think it's critically important. Yes, Mr. Secretary, I have to agree with you. I, I have definitely seen an increase of mill to mill relationships with India, for example. And I definitely have seen opportunities in areas like maritime security, right. even for other countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Maldives. So great opportunity in South Asia. So I'm going to shift to Northeast Asia. Um, I was stationed there for a couple of years as Naval Force Korea. So I'll be interested in your thoughts on this. Where do we stand on North Korea? Do you think we will achieve the final and fully verified denuclearization of North Korea? Sir? Yeah. So our policy remains the same. We want to pursue the complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, that's our stated goal policy. It has been. Uh, President Trump has been very clear about that. Um, he has made a lot of overtures to Kim Jong-un. Uh, clearly, the State Department is the lead on a diplomatic effort. And look, the United States is, has, has presented to them an alternative of what, what the North Korean future could look like if they would sit down and negotiate with us and come to an agreement on that policy goal that we've outlined. And uh, our role in the Department of Defense is to support those negotiations, which I, which I think are critically important. That is the best path forward, clearly. 
In the meantime, we have a responsibility uh, working alongside our partners in the Republic of Korea to maintain a readiness, a prepared mm -hmm. stance, the, the fight tonight capability uh, so that if things go bad, uh, we can deter and if necessary, fight and win. But look, we, we are constantly ready, uh, a, a good relationship with our ROC partners and, and our other allies in the region. But diplomacy is the way to go and we need to continue to pursue that goal uh, that I just outlined. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I remember a, a Korean phrase when I was there, kachi kapshida, kapshi kapshida, which we go together. We go and together. that remains the same even now, sir. Thank you very much. So finally, we come to the last question, sir. And, and this is a great question to end because it goes and looks to the future. Uh, for young officers or civil servants beginning a career in the Indo-Pacific uh, security arena, what advice would you offer on how to think strategically about the region? Yeah, boy, it's such a dynamic region, isn't it? I mean, I've been working it sure. since, uh, since at least 1995 when I was a plans officer in the Department of the Army when I was still in uniform. Uh, so that's how far I date on it. But, and it's evolved so much over those years. Uh, but it's very dynamic and uh, so much going on, such a diverse group of cultures and histories and, uh, and uh, challenges. I, I noted in my remarks how much trade passes through this region. You have seven of the world's 10 largest armies. So there's so much going on and so much potential as well that it's only going to evolve uh, and be more dynamic in the future. So I think the key thing is you got to be agile. You got to be flexible. You cannot have a static view about this region. And then I think in terms of what, you, what we should think about pursuing, it gets back to how do we network it together? How, how do we make uh, these partnerships and relationships, which often, if not too often, are bilateral in nature and multilateralizing because if you look around for all of our allies and partners, whether it's in Northeast Asia with uh, Japan or South Korea, or if you look further south to Australia and New Zealand, and I visit, have visited both places or look further in, in you know, other parts of the region, you see, again, we all have the same values and same interests and same concerns. And so we got to knit that together. We are stronger together than we are individually. And I think that is the challenge for not just this generation, but more so the next generation to keep building that together. We can't let the great distances, the vastness of ocean out there uh, be the obstacle to bringing us together. We got to continue to build those relationships, cu cut across any type of boundaries and obstacles because that is the future, I, I think. And that will, will, uh, will ensure that the Indo-Pacific remains free and open and uh, protected and secure for everyone over the next, for the rest of this century and beyond. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. It, it, it reminds me of an article I read recently that we really titled the Pacific is the, is the region of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And then further down in the article, it says it depends. It depends whether or not countries continue to collaborate and, and, and provide a secure and stable and prosperous region. Right. And I think all, all the remarks you said, sir, today leads to that with the free and open Indo-Pacific. That's right. And we, we have a responsibility to lead. The United States has a responsibility to lead. We've been a Pacific country, an Indo-Pacific country for quite a long time. Sure. And uh, we're not going to cede uh, this region. We're not going to cede uh, an, an, an inch of ground, if you will, to uh, another country, any other country that thinks that uh, their form of government, their views uh, on human rights, their views on sovereignty, their views on freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, all those things, uh, that somehow that's better uh, than what many of us share and know to be the case of the importance of individual rights and democracy and sovereignty and all those things that we value and we know keep us safe and secure and prosperous. Well, thank you, sir. So ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session. Secretary Esper, sir, thank you so much for just being with us today and sharing your insights. Uh, and they were very thoughtful, they were very candid and they were very, very detailed. Uh, this is the island style of fireside chat, sir. But really, for the virtual audience, you don't feel it. But Secretary Esper is very relaxed up here. You know, I wish I had my slippers and my bathrobe. But, sir, it was really wonderful to to have have you here with us and, and the kind words you've had. Do you have? We have a moment, sir. If it's okay, do you have any closing remarks or, or uh, words to the virtual audience that that came up on the net to listen to you, sir? Well, I felt like I've spoken so much uh, already. I, I would just say, look, I, I think, again, the, the, the work that you do here at this institute is critically important. It's based on a, a few principles that I know center in a way 
uh, really felt strongly about. It's, it's that transparency and accountability and the willingness to have open, candid discussions to, to resolve issues or to try and advance important ideas. Uh, and and that's, that's important about our democracy too, whether it's our democracy or any other country out there in the Indo-Pacific region that is so-called like-minded. I think continuing to advance those values is important. And that's the torch we have to hand off to the next generation that comes behind you and me and so many others who are sitting on these stages today or, or, uh, or engaged in these great discussions about the future of the Indo-Pacific. Yes, sir. Well, once again, sir, thank you so much uh, for making the time to be with us tonight. Thank you. But, but more importantly, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your continued service to our nation and your collaborative efforts with our allies and partners, our like-minded countries to collectively promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to once again pause just for a moment as we prepare uh, for the closing remarks of this session. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I wanted to especially call out the awesome team that we have here at our center that had planned and executed this first class speaker series. If I ask any of them, I know they would say, it's a team effort, director. And that's true, but it takes every individual's commitment to excellence to strive for something greater than self which results in phenomenal accomplishments I see from them day in and day out. Lenore Patton led this effort, who by the way is a plank owner of this center. And for those that do not have a Mariner's background, a plank owner is like the original crew, the first of the crew of a ship. So she's been here from the beginning in 1995, also along with Mike Hogan, who was also here. And he was here all week helping out. I'd also like to give a shout out to Mary Markovinovich, our lead PA. Mig Gina Pongachad works for Lenore. Our visual information team, and I underscore that as a team, including Dean Fujimoto, Paul Gatto, John McLean, Brian Sideretta, Scott Shira, and our awesome alumni team also here and working hard, putting together that collage of shout outs led by John Gassner. Well, I know that by naming a lot of folks, I may have left somebody out inadvertently. It's not intentional. Um, but for those that I've missed, you know, you know that I'm very proud of you. You know that I'm very thankful. So mahalo nui loa to our DKI APCSS team. You all make me very, very proud. Just know that you all represent a legacy of professionals that preceded you, that laid the framework for who we are today. So my hat is tipped to all the former directors, past and current faculty and staff of our center. This celebration is a reflection of your passion and dedication as well. I want to do a special recognition to a much respected leader of our center, Lieutenant General Hank Stackpole, who had recently passed away. I know his wife, Vivian, is up on Zoom. Together, they both worked as a team when Hank was our first director. It was Hank's vision of collaboration and cooperation that got us to where we are today. We miss you, Hank, and we will continue to strive to do you and our center proud. 
Of course, our thank yous wouldn't be complete without acknowledging both our supporters on the island. I mentioned DKI Institute and the foundation uh, on the mainland and worldwide. We had Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for the Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Dave Helvey here. He was here with the Secretary of Defense uh, and his team. We have Ms. Heidi Grant and the team at the Defense Security Cooperation Agency back in DC, who was our executive agent. The four other regional centers that work collaboratively with us on the same issues, but from a global perspective. Indo-PACOM, I mentioned, Indo-PACOM and Admiral Davison uh, for all their support, and as well as the numerous institutions and interagencies that we work with both here on the island, out in the region, back on the mainland. Uh, we work closely with such as the U.S. embassies and our local consular generals. Thank you all very much. Mahalo nui loa. The speaker series is both a celebration of the Senator Inouye's legacy, as well as to highlight 25th anniversary of the center that bears his name. The theme for our, our anniversary is hindsight, insight, and foresight, which is also the name of our new publication. So we have this book written by our faculty and edited by Dr. Alexander Vuving. It has 21 chapters which cover important issues in the region, how they evolved, how they can be shaped in the future to promote new opportunities for collaboration. This book will be available in September on our website at apcss.org. So as part of our 25th anniversary celebration, our alumni were invited to submit messages for the center. As we close out this evening, we hope you enjoyed this slideshow featuring alumni from more than 20 countries. Finally, for our alumni who are watching tonight at Zoom, via Zoom, thank you so much. Your energy, your passion, your focus, your focus has been awesome and it inspires us to even try harder. And so for those alumni that are up on the virtual, I encourage you to stay online for a talk story session with APCSS legendary Tom Patakula, who's the chief of admissions. Do you remember Tom? Mahalo for your kakua. And our alumni director, John Gassner. So once again, for every one of you that's been up, thank you for tuning in to the Daniel K. Inouye Speaker Series and for being part of our 25th anniversary celebration. Malama Pono, which means take care and aloha. On behalf of the DKI APCSS alumni in Malaysia, we wish you a happy 25th anniversary. Thank you very much. Happy anniversary to APCSS. Thanks again, APCSS, and happy 25th anniversary. I uh, would like to wish a uh, happy 25th anniversary to APCSS and Mahalo. So, thank you very much, APCSS. Aloha and happy 25th anniversary, APCSS. Thank you very much. Aloha, happy, and I wish uh, APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Happy anniversary, APCSS. That's why I'm very thankful for APCSS every 25th anniversary. Thank you very much, APCSS, and happy 25th anniversary. Thank you, and happy 25th anniversary. Thank you, APCSS, and happy 25th anniversary. Aloha. On behalf of the alumni in Bhutan, I wish DKI APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Trashitele. Aloha. I wish DKI APCSS a very happy 25th anniversary. Thank you. From Cambodia, happy 25th anniversary, DKI APCSS. Hello, on behalf of all the members of the Korea DKI APCSS Alumni Association, I wish the DKI Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies a happy 25th anniversary. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and aloha. 
from Maldives. Happy 25th anniversary, APCSS. Kia ora. Greetings from New Zealand. On behalf of the Kiwi alumni, I just want to wish APCSS a very happy 25th anniversary. All the best in all your future endeavours, and of course, very best wishes to all my old course mates. And Luis, today for Argentina. Happy anniversary. See you soon. Bye. Namaste, aloha. On behalf of the alumni of Nepal, I'd like to wish DKI APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Namaste. Aloha. On the occasion of the DKI anniversary, I'd like to wish all of you a very big congratulations from Japan. Aloha everybody, I am Hassan from Morocco. What a precious moment for me to wish DKAI APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Thank you for all. Stay safe. Aloha from Samoa, we wish DKAI APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Yamanuya. On behalf of the alumni in Colombia, I wish Daniel T. Ainoway, Asia Pacific Chile for Security Studies, a happy 25th anniversary. On behalf of the alumni in Bangladesh, I'd like to wish DKIABCSS a very happy 25th anniversary. From Indonesia, we wish DKIABCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Aloha, Aibo. On behalf of the alumni in Sri Lanka, we wish DKI APCSS a happy 25th anniversary. Thank you. From the Philippines, happy 25th anniversary to DKI APCSS. Mabuhay. On behalf of the alumni of the Kingdom of Tonga, I, Marcela Kalaniwan for the Philippines, wish DKI APCSS, a happy 25th anniversary. 